We're going to be talking about electromagnetic induction. So what is induction? Um, when you have a changing magnetic field, this produces an electric field. This is induction. Um, so when you, uh, for instance, when you move a magnet relative to a coil of wire, you are changing the magnetic field inside of that wire, um, and that induces a, a potential across the wire, which then induces a current. All right, so here you can see a couple of circuits. Uh, what you have here, this is an open switch. This is a potential source, a resistor, and then a loop of wire. Um, when you close the switch, then you get current flowing through the wire. So you get, uh, so current travels through here, and as current travels through the loop, it is creating a magnetic field. The changing magnetic field um, is going to change the, is going to change a mag, create a magnetic flux inside of the other, uh, a changing magnetic flux inside of the other loop, and then, um, and that is going to induce a current in this loop. Um, and then if you keep the, after a while, what's going to happen is that you, the system reaches a steady state, so the magnetic flux through the, um, through the loop is no longer changing. And when the magnetic flux is no longer changing, then uh, you, don't, you don't have a changing magnetic field through the second loop, so you end up getting no current. But then if you open the switch again, you suddenly have, uh, you are changing the current in, uh, in the loop. So uh, when you change the current in the loop, the first loop, you are changing the magnetic flux in the loop, and then you're changing the magnetic flux in the second loop. So you get a short-lived current in the second loop as it uh, tries to counteract the changing magnetic flux. All right, so what is magnetic flux? Magnetic flux is... The dot product of the magnetic field with the area, and then you integrate over the entire area. So in two dimensions, this is an area integral. Don't worry, we're going to do a couple of examples. All right, so here you can see an arbitrary area and the um, and a magnetic field. And so here you have the area, your, the area traveling through, the magnetic field traveling through the area. You use a normal vector perpendicular to the area, and uh, and the so the dot product of the magnetic field with the normal vector to the area is negative, um, and then you would integrate over the entire uh, over the entire area. So uh, and then if you have uh, the so if you change that angle, if you are, if the normal to the area is perpendicular to the magnetic field, you have the largest flux through the area. Whereas if you're changing the angle, you reduce the, if you're changing the angle you have of the area with respect to the magnetic field, you're reducing the magnetic flux. Um, so we can actually do a real simple, a real quick simple example. I have a magnetic field here. We're going to just assume that it is a constant magnetic field. And then I'm going to have a rectangular area. I will draw it with a little bit of perspective, but the right the rectangle is pointing toward is pointing towards you, and you're looking at it on the edge. And it makes an angle theta with respect to the magnetic field. Now I have an arbitrary choice of which uh, the, my normal vector is here. Um, I have an arbitrary choice as to whether I have it pointing up or down. Um, we constrain that choice when you have a closed area, and I'll get to that later, but for now we're just going to leave it, uh, there, there's an arbitrary choice. Um, and the main thing that we are concerned with is changing magnetic flux, not whether or not the um, magnetic flux is positive or negative. All right, so this is a rectangle, and I'm going to make it a rectangle which has a, one dimension is L and one dimension is W. 
So um, now I want to know the dot product of, so if I take the dot product of n with, uh, with the magnetic field, that gives me this length. That length is L, and then sine theta, no, let's see, opposite over hypotenuse, and I want to multiply by the hypotenuse, yeah, L sine theta. Um, so when theta is zero, I have no flux through my area. So B dot DA is then B sine theta, and I'm going to integrate um, from 0 to w and 0 to l. So I'm integrating over the entire area. And I get b length times width times sine theta. In other words, I'm looking at the area perpendicular to the magnetic field. So the area perpendicular to the magnetic field is L sine theta times W. So this guy is just the area. When you have, and I did this using calculus. I did a two. I set it up as a two, um, as a two D integral. But we already know. You we know the area of a square. So if you have a simple case where the magnetic field makes a constant angle with the um, with the area you are just calculating the area perpendicular to the magnetic field. This shows what happens if we have a more arbitrary, uh, arbitrary um, surface. So here you see um, what looks like a semicircle, and there's some circle bounding it, and then you can have different shapes, so you don't, there's no reason that it, the surface area has to be regular, um, and in some problems that will be quite irregular, um, no matter what, because all of the magnetic flux that travels through this area has to go through the circle, and everything, all the magnetic flux that goes through this area has to also go through the circle, and same here, then the value of the flux is going to be the same for all three surfaces. So it doesn't actually matter. All right, so here you can see a square curl, um, a square coil of wires, of, of wire, which has a bunch of different turns around it. Um, and the magnetic field is perpendicular to the, uh, it is perpendicular to the surface of the coil. So the magnetic flux is going to be at its maximum. So V uh, sine theta is simply going to be b, because theta is 90 degrees. And then we have to multiply by the area. So our flux, which is b times the area times the sine of the angle between the area, uh, between the normal vector to the surface and the, um, and the magnetic field in these simple cases where it's a constant magnetic field, is equal to the magnetic field, and this is a square, the area of a square is the length squared, so the magnetic flux here is simply B times the length squared. All right, and what we're really interested in this chapter is induction. Induction is the phenomenon where 
When you have a changing magnetic flux, you induce an electric field. Um, this is, for historical reasons, often called the electromotive force, um, but it really just means that you're creating a potential, an electric potential in the circuit when you're changing the, um, the magnetic flux. All right, so here, um, a, what, this, what this equation means is that anytime you change the magnetic flux through a circuit, it is going to induce a potential. And then you can see some impacts from that potential because that potential can then in turn induce a current. Um, and this leads to all sorts of phenomena responsible for almost every piece of electronics that you use. All right, so here what happens if you have a magnetic, um, you have a little magnet and you, uh, and you insert the magnet into uh, a loop of wire. When you have a bar magnet, the, uh, the field lines uh, exit the north end and then loop around and enter the south end of the magnet. So here, um, I do have to be careful because of the mirror image problem. So here, the magnetic field lines leave the north, um, leave the north pole of the magnet and they are, uh, as you push the magnet in, to the, uh, the loop of wire, you are putting field lines. You're, you're increasing the magnetic flux in, through the loop because you're putting, force, forcing field lines through the loop of wire. Now, when you do this, uh, the, all of the phenomena that we're gonna talk about are from our consequences of the fact that the system resists change. So when you change the magnetic flux through the, through the wire, the wire is going to respond by producing a current which tries to keep the magnetic flux through the wire the same. So when you push your bar magnet, your north pole goes through here, you're going to create a current that makes a, uh, that makes a magnetic field in the opposite direction of the bar magnet. So because I've got the mirror image of all my slides here. So here, that's not the, the relevant arrow. We're gonna switch the directions of the area, arrows. All right, so you induce a magnetic current in this direction. So you are creating a potential difference across the wire, which is inducing a current because you're sticking the magnet through. Now, when you push a south pole uh, magnet through, what you're doing, you're create, you're forcing the magnetic flux in this direction. So the magnetic flux is now in this direction, and you're going to create a, a current that causes the magnetic flux to be in the opposite direction. So, you induce a current like this. Now, eventually, if you let that magnet sit uh, for a while, because the potential difference is that you're creating is a function of, it's the relative to the derivative of the magnetic flux. So you push that bar magnet in, you let it sit there for a while, there will be current, but the current will eventually stop. And then um, if you pull the bar magnet out, you are changing the magnetic flux again. So now I'm gonna yank the bar magnet out and I am decreasing. So the flux here used to be in that direction. So as I increased, I had to create a current that, act, that would make a magnetic field opposite the direction of the magnetic flux I was forcing through. Now I'm gonna to try to keep the magnetic flux the same. So my current is going to be in the opposite direction. All right, so now we can have a solenoid. If you remember a solenoid from the previous chapter, a solenoid is a loop of wires and a loop of wires creates a, a magnetic field. Um, so when that current is constant, you're gonna get a constant magnetic field inside of the loop of wires. So first you, uh, 
you connect the loop of wire to your potential source, it's going to reach equilibrium. Equilibrium has current traveling from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So you've got current flowing around like this. When I open the switch, all of a sudden, there's no current traveling through the wire. So you're going to, uh, you've changed the potential, you're gonna, and that changing potential, suddenly the current going this way cannot create, a, is, cannot create a magnetic field, so you're gonna create a potential. So if you had current going this way before, then I'm gonna draw that solenoid much bigger so that we can see. All right, and now I've got my current in this direction, and that is going to, inside the coil, that creates a magnetic field in this direction, when I have current flowing in that direction. So when I turn off, when I disconnect the terminals, I'm turning off the battery, all of a sudden, that magnetic field is not there. So I am going to try to create a current that, uh, that will keep the magnetic flux the same. So I am going to try to, it's going to try to keep the current traveling through even though the battery is, uh, or sorry, it's gonna try to keep the, let's see here, what you do in B, you open the current. So now um, you're gonna, the current is gonna flow so that it um, tries to keep the magnetic flux the same. And so here, whereas before the battery was um, leading, was pushing it to have a current like this, to get the current to, to get the, um, to get the magnetic flux to stay the same, it's going, you're going to see an induced potential which is in the opposite direction. So you have suddenly, um, remember the magnetic, the potential is the negative of the magnetic flux. You have just suddenly turned off the potential, so you're gonna create a, mag you're gonna create a potential opposite to the magnetic flux. And now, you're gonna get current traveling in the opposite direction because you've created a potential in the opposite direction. All right, so here we can look at an example. We've got a magnetic field. The magnetic field is pointing towards U. And now um, we have a decreasing magnetic field. Here is our current, uh, or here is our coil of wire. If the magnetic coil, if the field is decreasing, and it is pointing towards you, our wire is going to, let's see, I'm not used to doing the left-hand rule, but I gotta use the stage right. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna get a current. I'm gonna try to have it, let's, let's see, this is pointing towards me. That means that I have to have the current this way. It's gonna point counterclockwise, pointing towards, uh, I'm not gonna use clockwise and counterclockwise because you're seeing the mirror image. It's gonna point towards, it's gonna create a magnetic field pointing towards you so that the magnetic field, the magnetic flux through the wire stays constant. All right, this is, uh, this can create a number of really cool demonstrations. Um, so when you have, for instance, you have a circuit off and then you have a metal ring sitting on the solenoid, then you, uh, you turn on the solenoid, all of a sudden you have created a huge flux inside of that uh, inside of that metal ring, and it doesn't like it. Nature abhors changing flux. It's going to fight it, and the way that it can fight it is by having the um, is having the solenoid uh, having the ring pop off of the solenoid. 
All right. So here, um, these there's a series of problems in in the book that you can do that calculate the um, the currents in different uh, circuits depending on uh, the changing flux. So here you start with a square loop of wire outside of the region with the magnetic field, and then you push it in. When you push this, uh, when you push this loop of wire into the magnetic field, it is going to fight the, um, the change in magnetic flux. So it is going to induce a current to make the magnetic flux stay constant. So now this magnetic field is pointing towards me and uh, we're going to, I want to create a magnetic field pointing towards you because as I push this ring in, I am creating, I am increasing the magnetic flux and so if I have a current this way, it induces a magnetic field pointing towards you, which is going to tend to keep the magnetic flux constant. Um, and then here you have a loop which is rotating in a magnetic field. Uh, the rotating loop, as you change the angle, when, so field pointing, we will, the field is pointing this way, now, I am a loop of wire. When I am in this direction, my magnetic flux is at a maximum. When I am in this direction, my magnetic flux is zero. And then I'm changing the magnet. Now it's the same magnetic flux, but an opposite sign. So when I rotate like this, I am, my magnetic flux is oscillating um, between negative values to zero and up to positive values. And that changing magnetic flux is going to induce a current. Any ideas what this thing is called? This acts as a generator. Um, so if you have a region of a constant magnetic field and you rotate a loop of wire in it, you are generating electricity. All right. Another phenomenon that you can do. So here you have a moving rod. I don't know if these are actually useful devices. I've only ever seen them as examples in physics textbooks. And you also can do this in the laboratory. So now you have, uh, um, you have a circuit which consists of a resistor, wires, and a movable rod. When you have this movable rod, um, you have, so you are pushing the rod to in this direction. Um, and when you do that, you are increasing the magnetic, the magnitude of the magnetic flux. The magnetic flux is pointing towards me. And when you have, so we want, we are going to induce a current which creates a magnetic flux towards you. So that one creates a magnetic flux towards me this way produces a magnetic flux towards you. So it, it, we are going to induce a current in this direction because we are increasing the magnetic flux and the current is going to fight the change in the magnetic flux. All right, now here, this is an example. You have, a cur have current traveling through two rails um, and there is a conductive projectile. Um, and you can, if you change, the magnetic field, you will actually end up shooting the projectile. All right, here um, we have a rod with a finite with finite dimensions, and then as you uh, if you have the rod moving, then you also can induce a, a current in the rod itself. All right, so the way you sort this one out is that you. Um, have you draw a rectangle, so you have an imaginary rectangle, um, and in this rectangle, the uh, the flux is the magnetic field times the length times the, the length of the box times the width of the box, and the flux, the derivative of the flux as with respect to time is b l d x d t because that length x is changing 
Um, and the time derivative of the flux is equal to the negative of the potential created. Um, so here, this turns out to not actually depend on the box existing. You still get a potential difference as you, uh, as you move that rod. So let's imagine that we are a, we're going to imagine that we have a positive charge sitting. Let me use a different color so it stands out against the figure. We have a positive charge sitting right here. That positive charge is moving in this direction. Um, and the magnetic field is pointing here, pointing towards me. So we have V cross B. There is going to be a force upward on that positive charge. That means that the positive charges, there's going to be an excess of positive charges down here and a deficit of negative charges there. So as we have, if we have a conducting rod moving through a magnetic field, you get a change, in, a change in potential across the magnetic field, even though there is actually no closed circuit. All right, and this motional electromotive force or the potential difference created when you have a conductor which is moving um, is, was actually how they used, uh, um, they could, Talk to a to a satellite tethered to the space shuttle, um, and you can you actually get a um, you because of the magnetic field surrounding the Earth, you will actually get a difference in the potential across that wire. All right, so here we have an example. All right, so in this example, uh, you have a rod which is so this is a wire. This is a resistor, and you have a rod which is rotating, um, moving closer and closer to the resistor. So uh, you have a changing magnetic flux because you're changing the amount of area enclosed in the circuit. So we can calculate the, um, the changing area. So if we look at a small segment here, um, what is the area of this circuit? What is the area that we are changing? So here, this is the area. This has a length of R theta. As long as we have a small segment, that is then we can approximate this as a triangle and this has length r. So our area is one half times the width of the triangle times the height of the triangle, or one half r squared theta. And when we, so then our flux is equal to v dot D, v dot A. Now the A, the area is perpendicular to the magnetic field, so our flux is equal to B times one half R squared theta. Don't want that dot there. All right. So then, when we are trying to calculate the potential created, the radius stays the same. So the potential created by the changing, by the moving rod is negative d phi dt, but the only thing changing is theta, um, and v theta dt is omega, so this potential difference is negative one half times the magnetic field, R squared, and then D theta DT. So we create a magnetic flux, we, or sorry, we create a potential because, uh, because we have the rod rotating. The changing potential across this region induces a current, and you can calculate what, what that current is. 
um, simply using Ohm's law, V equals IR, um, where this is our potential. Um, and the book goes on further and calculates the energy. I'm going to skip that part. So here you can see an, uh, a rectangular coil of wire rotating in a constant magnetic field. And if I, have, if I am a loop of wire and I am rotating in a constant magnetic field, I am changing the flux, and that is in turn going to induce an electric, uh, a potential which is going to induce a current. So now we can calculate what that is. Um, we have it rotating at a given end rotating at a certain speed. So we can calculate the flux. The flux is VA and then times cosine theta because the way that this theta has been determined, so you always have to look at the definition. So we want the component of B perpendicular to the area. So we're looking for this component. So the flux is B A cosine theta. And then we need the derivative, V phi dt. The magnetic field is staying constant. The area is staying constant. And now we have to take the derivative of this. Theta is changing. So to take the derivative of this, we take D cosine theta d theta times d theta dt. This is just an application of the chain rule. Um, so I know I have, d, I have theta changing. I can simply, if I want the change in flux as a function of time, I apply the chain rule. All right, so this is b a, and then I get the derivative of Cosine is the negative sine, and then I have an omega, and I'm going to squeeze my omega in there so that it's clear that it's not in the argument of the sine. All right, and then if I have more coils, so that tells me if I have more coils, then the total flux change is the number of the, is the change in the flux through one coil times the number of coils. Um, so then the electric, the electric potential induced by this changing magnetic flux is negative N, negative the number of coils times the change in flux per unit time for one coil. So this is equal to omega N V A sine theta. And you can also write if we have omega is the rate of change of theta. So we can write that theta is omega as a function of time. And you can choose to replace this with omega t. So then you get some, the, elect, the potential created is some constant times sine omega t. All right, and this is actually how a generator works. All right, and in this example, we have a current which is exponentially decaying inside of a solenoid. So you have, uh, so the current is traveling through the solenoid, exponentially decaying. That'll become relevant in the next chapter. And the question is, um, what is the, um, what is the magnitude of the, in, the induced Electri the electric potential in that solenoid. So for a solenoid, solenoid the um, magnetic field is mu naught times the number of coils per unit length uh, times the current and the flux is going to be the um, the flux is 
the amount of that magnetic field which is perpendicular to the area. In this case, the, the magnetic field is all perpendicular to the area of the solenoid. So we have mu naught N A times the current. And in this case, you are given that the current is I naught E to the negative omega T. Um, so we get that our flux is mu naught I naught N A E to the negative omega T. And we need to take our time derivative of that flux, d phi dt, and this is equal to, the constants come along for the ride, I have a negative omega, And then here I have e to the negative omega t. So that is my change in flux. So I get an induced electric field of the negative of that. All right, now we can talk about an, a practical application of this fact that the changing magnetic flux always induces, is going to induce some current. Nature is fighting changing magnetic flux. So this application is eddy currents. So if you have, for instance, now we have these big magnets, and I'm going to swing a conductor through the magnets. And when I swing, the, when the conductor goes into the magnet, it is all, all of a sudden in feeling a change in magnetic flux. So it is going to induce a current to try to fight that magnetic flux to keep the potential inside, to keep the um, magnetic flux inside of that region constant. Um, now I can disturb that a little bit. So instead of, a, instead of a big flat spatula with a, without any holes in it, I have a slotted spatula. I got them at Spatula City. So now I slip the, sp the slotted spatula through the, um, through the field. It's not as easy to induce currents there. Um, so because there's, there's, not a big, um, there's not a big area when I can get current, where I can create currents. So um, this is not going to have as much potential difference um, as, as the big solid conductor. And then finally, I can have a, a plastic spatula, which does not conduct. Um, could conduct electricity. And when I pass it through the magnetic field, it's not going to change the, um, it's not going to lead to any induced electric currents at all. Um, so here you can look in more detail at what's going on when you pass that, that spatula from spatula city through the, um, through the magnetic field. So here you have an electric force pointing towards me. The spatula, okay, when it starts to enter the area, you're going to induce a current. So you're creating, you're get, pushing more magnetic field in this direction. So you're going to induce a current that creates a magnetic field in, the, that's going to create a magnetic field pointing towards you. So that is this way. And then the opposite is going to happen over here when the spatula leaves the, leaves the region with the magnetic field. Whereas when you have the slotted spatula, when it in, enters the magnetic field, it can form small loops, but it can't quite form as big of the, um, it can't find, it, it can't get current loops that are as large. So um, what happens is that when you have a big flat spatula, it experiences some magnetic drag. It is resisting going into that, um, going into that region with the magnetic field and fighting it with current loops. The slotted spatula doesn't have as much magnetic drag. All right, and an application of this magnetic damping is, for instance, precision scales where, um, and 
whatever, however much you love your digital scales, the old classical balance beam type scales tend to actually be more accurate. So here, but when you're trying to weigh something small, all of the vibrations can get can make this difficult. So you have magnetic damping where you have a conductor placed between two magnets and it's going to slow those oscillations. All right, moving on to generators. So we've talked a little bit about generators. I am a coil of wire and a coil of wire in a magnetic field. I'm changing my flux. So I am inducing a current. Um, and this is how a generator works. So what you can do is that you have, uh, you create, you have something rotating a coil of wire of some sort inside of a magnetic field. Um, and the generator is similar to a motor. For a motor, you have current force through a wire inside a magnetic field, and it will cause that wire to rotate. So there are two sides of the same coin. You either um, have your wire and you rotate it, and that creates a current, or you have your wire inside of a magnetic field and you force current through it, and that's going to cause it to rotate. And the fact that you then have this coil rotating inside of a wire, you can get something called back EMF, which is when the, um, the wire actually resists having current force through it because you're changing the you are creating a change in current inside of a magnetic field. All right, now we can move on to some examples. All right, so the first one of these, how would changing the radius of loop D um, affect its EMF, assuming that C and D are much closer together than their radii? All right, so if we have loop D, loop, loop C, so when we, when we close the circuit, what happens is that we get, uh, um, we get current this way, and then we're going to have current traveling through here, and line my thumb up with the current, and the magnetic field is pointing towards me, Loop, uh, loop D is right next to it. So when you have the, um, when you turn on the circuit, you're creating a magnetic flux in loop D that is pointing towards, the magnetic field is pointing towards me. So you're going to induce a current in the opposite direction. So if the current's in this direction, then the current in loop D is going to be in the opposite direction when you turn on the switch. And then if you increase loop D, then uh, you're still, because the field, so you, it, the field lines have to go, they, they wrap around eventually, but the field lines around a loop of wire are very large. So, is, so if, as long as you're not changing the, the radius of loop D, um, much compared to, uh, you're not changing it so much that you're bringing in the field lines returning um, through loop C, then you're not actually going to change the, um, the magnetic flux, flux of loop D significantly. All right, so now you have the same conducting loops, and uh, when you close the switch, what is the, what is the direction of the current induced in D? So here I have the magnetic field is pointing towards me in C. Um, as I try to rotate my hand. So if the magnetic field is pointing towards me in C, I've got... I've got a current like this that is barely legible. I've got a current like this, and the current in D is going to be in the exact opposite direction because it's going to fight the changing magnetic flux. Um, and then when the switch is opened, then all of a sudden the flux is going to decrease, so the direction of the current through loop D switches. All right, 
the north pole of a magnet is moved towards a copper loop. The first thing that we have to sort out here is where the field lines are. For a magnet, for when you have a north pole, um, the field lines emanate from the north pole and they're going to wrap around and close and connect to the south pole. So now I am forcing a magnetic flux um, through this loop and I am going to lead to, so let's see, so I have a magnetic flux down, I'm, I'm creating a magnetic flux down, so I am going to induce a current which produces a magnetic flux up inside of the loop. So it's going to loop like this. All right, so in this figure, you have a conducting ring as it moves through various positions inside, in the, um, as it moves into and out of a magnetic field. So magnetic field is pointing in this direction. I am moving the, the loop this direction. So right now there's no magnetic flux. And then I put it into the magnetic uh, field and I am going to, I've created a magnetic flux, which is, I, I've created a mag, I've pushed magnetic field through that way. So I am going to, um, let's see, this way creates, this way makes a magnetic flux into the loop. So I am going to go, let's see, this way, I'm going to have the current going this way. Then I, that current dies down when I'm here. And now I'm starting to pull, I'm reducing the magnetic flux. So before, whereas I was this way, now my current is going to go in the opposite direction. All right. So now this is saying, say, so find the direction of the induced current in all of the cases. So now magnetic, uh, I'm increasing the magnetic flux through that wire. So I am going to, so pointing this way, and I am going to create the magnetic flux so that it goes in the opposite direction. Right, I will just do one of those. These are really tricky when I'm using the mirror image, so I'm not going to do too many lest I accidentally get them all tripped up. All right, now you have a copper sheet that is um, partially in a magnetic field. When it is pulled to the right, um, it resists. Uh, or sorry, when it is pulled to the right, a resisting force pulls it to the left. Explain. Well, that's because it is there it is inducing uh, eddy currents and trying to keep the electric uh, and that that uses energy that's it's trying to keep the magnetic flux constant what happens if it pushes if you push it to the left the same thing because if you push it to the left you are also changing the magnetic flux and it is going to resist changing the magnetic flux all right this one is pretty redundant with the previous one all right, now you have a magnetic field through a circular loop of radius 10 centimeters, varies in time as shown below. The field is perpendicular to the loop. Plot the magnitude of the induced EMF in the loop as a function of time. So here we go back to the induced EMF is the change in magnetic flux per unit time, which is, uh, in this case, so it is the change the time derivative of the magnetic field times the area. In this case, the area is staying constant and it is the magnetic field which is changing. So the induced EMF is the area times the time derivative in the magnetic field. So here um, in the first segment, I will label this a, in the first segment, the, let's see, we'll just plug in the EMF. It is a radius of 10 centimeters, so negative pi 
10 centimeters squared, which I've just converted to meters squared because that's what I do. If you always convert to SI units, you don't, you don't have to worry about your final units. They will work out to be correct. All right, and then the time derivative in the magnetic field, we, chain, we increase 3 times 10 to the negative 3 Tesla in 2 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. So I end up with 1 and a half, and it's a positive derivative, so I end up with 1 and a half times pi times 10 to the negative 4. So 1.5 pi, 10 to the negative 4 volts. All right. In section B, the time derivative of the magnetic field is zero, and the area is constant. So there is no, chain, no induced voltage. In time step C, I have the same constants out in front, pi times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. Now my derivative is negative, so I change the sign right there, and I change 6 times 10 to the negative 3 Tesla in 1 times 10 to the negative 3 uh, seconds. So then this is 6 pi. I wrote 10 to the negative 14, but I meant to write 10 to the negative 4. 6 pi times 10 to the negative 4 volts. All right, so here you have a foil, a coil, um, a single rectangular coil. It has a resistance of 2 ohms. The magnetic field at all points um, inside the coil varies. And then this one I need to read according to, let me write that one up there. The magnetic field is B naught e to the negative alpha t, where b naught is 0.25 tesla, and alpha is 2 hertz. 2 hertz or 200 hertz? 200 hertz. What is the current induced in the coil uh, at t equals 1 millisecond, 2 milliseconds, and 2 seconds? We won't work all the way through this one. We'll get it set up. So uh, the magnetic flux is equal. I'm going to leave everything as variables. Um, the magnetic flux is the magnetic field times the length times the width. The time derivative of the magnetic, magnetic flux is negative alpha um, B naught E to the negative alpha T times the length times the width. Um, and then uh, this gives us so this tells us that the induced potential is alpha, B naught e to the negative alpha t times length times width. And this is equal to the current times the resistance. So it is asking what the current is. The current is alpha L W over R B naught E to the negative alpha T. All right, so this is a similar problem. Now we are given a time dependent magnetic field, which isn't terribly legible up there, so I'm going to rewrite it. C, some constant, C. And then x cosine omega t x hat
plus y sine omega t z hat. Let me, yes, that is, so then the question is uh, to determine the change in the magnetic, uh, the induced potential as a function of time. Ah, and it's written right there nice and large. Uh, so then we need to know, first of all, the flux is V dot A. So the only component which is perpendicular to the magnetic, the magnetic field, magnetic field is only um, perpendicular to A when it is in the Z direction. So this component does not contribute at all. Our area is A times V, and then the magnetic field that contributes is Y sine omega T. And that is as a, so this is as a function of, um, that gives you the flux. We have to, ah, we have to integrate here. This one's a little bit trickier because that actually gives us a small segment of flux. So our segment V A is equal to Z hat dx dy. So we're going to have to do the full integral. We have to do the full integral because we need to integrate over the entire loop in order to get the total magnetic flux. So now V dot V A is equal to uh, is equal to C Y sine omega T D X D Y. And now we need to do an integral over the area. So we copy this over. And as a function of position, the sine of, so our, let's see, our total flux is the integral of V dot V A. This is constant with respect to X and Y, so I can actually bring the sine omega T out. So I get C sine omega T and then the integral uh, of y dx dy. My integra integral over a goes from or over <clears throat> x goes from zero to a. My integral over b goes from zero to b. And these conveniently factorize. So I have c, um, and then I'm going to put my sine omega t over here because I don't want it to look like the answers, the other parts are in the argument of the sine. I do my integral over x and I get a b. I do my integral over y and I get a squared over 2. I'm actually going to scooch this sine omega t over a little bit so it doesn't look so funny. All right, so that gives me my flux, and then I need to know the induced um, the induced electric potential is negative, the negative of the time derivative of the flux. So I get the derivative of sine is cosine. So I get, and then I pull out an omega. So I get C, B, A squared, omega, cosine, omega, T divided by 2. All right, and then this one gives us the magnetic flux, um, and it says, 
that the magnetic flux is given by 2 e to the negative 3t times sine of 120 pi p, where the flux is given in Weber's, the SI unit of flux, um, and what is the direction and magnitude of the current through the resistor uh, at two different times. Now, we're just going to work out how you would do it, and I'm not going to get the final numerical answers. So, we need, first of all, we'll take the time derivative. I'm going to go ahead and jump to negative time derivative to give us the flux. Negative, and then here we have to use the chain rule. Um, so we've got, I'm going to, we've got negative 2, negative 3, e to the negative 3t sine 120 pi t. And then the negative from there. So now we have to take the derivative of this. And this guy comes along for the ride. 2 e to the negative 3t. And then we get uh, 100 and 20 pi cosine 120 pi t. So that gives us the potential. Um, the if so, this is leading to a changing, a decreasing magnetic flux. The um, because the magnitude is well, the overall envelope is changing, um, and then. This gives us a time dependence, but at time at t equals zero, the flux is positive and decreasing. So at t equals zero, so the magnetic field is in this direction, and the, the magnetic field is decreasing, so we're going to create a current that's, that points towards me, so it's going to travel in this direction Oh, no, sorry, we want to create a current that points towards you, so it's going to travel in that direction because if I point in, if I lead, if I have a current in that, in this direction, then my, um, my induced magnetic field is in that direction, and it counteracts the decrease in the magnetic field. Now, at the other times, you would need to look at whether or not the flux is increasing or decreasing, and that would tell you whether or not the um, tell you which direction the um, which direction the induced current is traveling in. All right, now we're going to determine the direction of the induced current in each case. So here we have a rod which is moving in this direction. It is decreasing. The magnetic flux, the magnetic flux is pointing, the magnetic field is pointing towards you. So we're going to have a current in this direction so that the magnetic flux, the magnetic flux is trying to stay the same. In this case, if I am reading the figure correctly, the magnetic field is pointing towards you, and the loop is the the loop is moving perpendicular to the or, sorry, parallel to the magnetic field. So here's my loop, and there's no magnetic flux anyways. So there is, in fact, no induced current. Here, I have a loop, and I am pushing it into this area. So I am leading to a, I'm, the magnetic field through the, the magnetic flux through the loop is increasing. I'm going to try to create a current that creates a magnetic field pointing towards me because the magnetic field I'm forcing through it is pointing towards you. So the magnetic field, let's see, inside the loop, the magnet, that may, this leads to a magnetic field pointing towards you. So I want, I want to, instead of going in this direction, I'm going to go in 
this direction. All right, I think that's enough on that one. All right, and now we have a similar problem. You have a rectangular loop and it is moving to the right. Um, and if the mag, so assuming the magnetic field is uniform between the pole faces and negligible elsewhere, what is the induced EMF in the loop? So now I have a magnetic field in this direction. I am, as I pull the loop out, I'm decreasing the magnetic flux in, and I want to increase the magnetic field, the ma magnetic flux in that direction. So I need the magnetic, let's see, that direction would pour, create a magnetic field towards you. This direction, that's towards you, and ah, I'm not used to my stage right rule. Yeah, I want, I want it in this direction. All right, and with that, we will go ahead and end this chapter, and I'll see you for the next one.